Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, my name is Daniel Bohannon, and today we're going to look um, for the first time uh, in public at a new tool that I uh, released about 20 minutes ago um, called Invoke Cradle Crafter. Um, so just a little bit about me. Uh, I am an incident response consultant with Mandiant um, based out of the Washington, D.C. area. Been there for about two years. Um, prior to that, spent about five years doing IT operations and security for a restaurant franchise um, in the U.S. Um, and my day-to-day -day role pretty much looks like incident response as well as um, threat hunting, kind of detection, um, evasion, obfuscation techniques and research, um, and, and actually applying that um, in the real world. So um, in January, I was uh, speaking at a conference, and this gentleman tweeted, uh, Daniel Bohannon, true American, always has a cat in the presentation. So uh, I figured maybe, I, I didn't realize I was such a strong stereotype, but given all the presentations today, it definitely is. Um, so I figured I would uh, counter with that. I'm a nice little American meme. <laughs> but, but to be fair, the best one, and probably the more accurate one, is this, a nice oversized cat with Starbucks. So, so sorry, Ilya, I had, to get, uh, I had to get one cat meme in there, but I promise that's all. So what are we going to look at today? Uh, first, I'm going to just briefly talk about motiv my motivation of why am I still researching obfuscation? Um, haven't I caused us defenders enough trouble with that? Um, and then we're going to look at the current state of PowerShell obfuscation, as well as the current state of, detection, of detecting this obfuscation. And then we're going to look at the new stuff, looking at really cryptic cradles um, from three different perspectives, from a syntax a kind of cradle genre perspective, as well as um, obfuscation that we can apply at the token layer um, that's not in invoke obfuscation, and then looking at a myriad of different invocation syntaxes that, as defenders, we should be aware of and be looking for. Then we're going to look at detecting these cryptic cradles, um, or our best efforts at starting to do that as well as, um, finally, a uh, live demo, um, and hopefully that goes well. A few disclaimers, and this, is, these, this comes from a lot of questions I've gotten um, in the past when I talk about this, um, or this sort of material. First of all, blocking PowerShell is not a realistic option. Um, and in one short sentence, that's because PowerShell.exe is not PowerShell. And a great, uh, a really simple way, it's completely different to think about it, is if your attacker renames PowerShell.exe, how good is that if you're trying to only block PowerShell.exe? So you can obviously go deeper, look at internal file name, but it's not a great option, and there's a lot more good that you can do with PowerShell, especially if you're on the latest version of PowerShell. Um, this leads to the second point, which is uh, a quote from noted blue teamer Jared Haight, um, and that is, PowerShell is not special. And what he means by that is that uh, there's a lot of reports that talk about the increase of malicious uses of, of PowerShell, but almost all of those are in cases where the attacker already has code execution on the system. So if your user opens a macro or opens a document, enables a macro, and PowerShell happens to be used to download a binary, that's not a PowerShell problem. That's a user opening a freaking macro problem. PowerShell just happened to be their tool of choice to download the file. And lastly, PowerShell 5.0 is your new best friend. And I say new because it's been around since 2014. Um, and these are two really good blog posts looking at um, the first one specifically logging around PowerShell 5. And the second one is um, by Microsoft a really great uh, blog post and white paper on just all the benefits of PowerShell 5. So my motivation. Attackers are obfuscating, and they have been for a while. Um, and for some reason, in the past six months, they've been doing it a lot more. I don't know why. Um, and it, it, you know, PowerShell is such a great platform for them because it's, uh, you know, it's uh, native on all modern Windows operating system. It's signed uh, at, uh, Windows binary. And typically, it's whitelisted if app whitelisting isn't in, in the environment. So once Invoke Shellcode and Invoke Mimikatz came to be, the security community really started to take notice, and we started to see a proliferation of offensive PowerShell frameworks, as well as defensive as well. Um, and it's really, Im it, for all practical reasons, impossible to detect this kind of usage of PowerShell if you don't, at a very minimum, have command line logging or command line auditing. Um, but uh, the, really what you want to get to is having the script lock module and transcription logs that PowerShell 5 makes available. So uh, what's my obsession with obfuscation? Why do I keep doing it? One of my colleagues said, what's your sickness? Like, why, do, why, why don't you just you know, be OK with where it's at? Um, and this is because th this is really taking the, the whole realm of obfuscation and looking um, directly at one of the main things that attackers like to do, which is download and execute remote code with PowerShell. Um, and so with this, this really started by looking and documenting obscure cradle syntaxes that we see, um, strangely enough, commodity malware using some of the more interesting ones, and then enumerating that and finding uh, cradles I have yet to see uh, be, un uh, be used in the wild um, and cataloging that. Um, and I put all of this into this tool to kind of make it like a living library, because to be honest, 
I got tired of copying and pasting um, out of my notes and having, you know, having syntax errors and having to replace stuff. So a tool is definitely the easiest way to keep that in check. So the current state of PowerShell obfuscation. Where are we at today? Well, this has really been my life for the past um, year and a half. Um, again, as a defender, um, uh, I, I get really excited when I find interesting PowerShell artifacts. Um, and in my day to day, um, what I've been doing for the past year and a half uh, has been working on um, host-based and network-based detection for, for mainly for PowerShell, but for other stuff as well. And it wasn't until I got um, to, uh, to be able to play with our, um, our tool called HIP, which is our real-time agent that we use in investigations. Um, it stands for Host Inve Investigative Platform. And once I started to do this, I was able to see the results really, really quickly. Um, and I basically started to come up with obscure syntaxes to get around our, our trigger logic. Um, and I would go to the owner and say, hey, can we update this? Can we update this? And day after day, week after week, it got to the point where he said, why don't I give you access? And you can come up with the weird syntaxes and the, uh, the detection for it. And so that kind of turned into um, a, a somewhat unofficial role. And that's what I've been doing um, ever since. Um, and it's been a lot of fun. And so uh, last year at DerbyCon, um, I released this tool called Invoke Obfuscation, kind of the culmination of this research um, to automate the um, obfuscation of PowerShell commands and scripts. Um, and it does this at four different layers. Um, and so uh, I if you haven't seen this tool or, uh, or seen the previous talk, I'm going to go through at a really high level to show you this, l this kind of obfuscation so that we can see how Invoke Cradle Crafter um, in today's talk is a bit different. So the first layer, um, tokens. So basically, I went through this example. This is the most common um, remote download cradle. And if th that's our attacker command at the top, then as a defender on the bottom, if we look for those four strings, then we'll catch that command. But basically, we're going to walk through and see um, if we start obfuscating, we can actually bypass that detection. So we're going to obfuscate the command and update our detection. So for example, we don't need system dot. We can remove that. Anytime you see a string, we can concatenate it. We can use double quotes, single quotes, white space, et cetera. When it comes to methods, download string is the most common because it's memory only and it's a string, an expression. However, it is a method of the net.webclient class. And there are a ton of methods. And I want you to look at these four. So download string, download um, data, uh, open read, which is the one that I've only seen once or twice, um, and then uh, download file. These are four that in invoke obfuscation, it will never substitute one method for another because it's actually changing the result. If you go from top to bottom, you have it returning an expression, a file to disk, a byte array, or a byte stream. And so there's additional wrappers you need around that command to convert it back to an expression to invoke it. So invoke obfuscation will never do this, but invoke cradle crafter can. And that's the whole point. Um, additionally, so invoke obfuscation will say, OK, if we have a method, um, we can put single quotes around it. We can put double quotes around it. And once we do that, we can actually put a tick mark, or like a lot of tick marks. Uh, and then after that, we can look at arguments, do, this, do a lot of different stuff as well. So we'll just use tick marks in this example. When it comes to commandlets, these are the three options that are in invoke obfuscation. If we see a commandlet, doesn't matter what it is, we can add tick marks. We can concatenate it as a string and then invoke it with a dot or an ampersand. Or we can reorder it, basically any string manipulation, and then invoke it with a dot or ampersand. But in invoke cradle crafter, we can be more creative. And the reason this isn't in invoke obfuscation is because there are some fringe cases in which it actually doesn't work as expected. Um, and so um, since we're dealing with more tightly constrained um, syntax in invoke cradle crafter, we can use different obfuscation. So I've chosen to implement this kind of obfuscation. So we can use git command or this 1.0 syntax for git command and actually use wildcard. So instead of new object, that wildcard happens to return it. And instead of git command, we can use an alias um, or uh, yeah, an alias of GCM. And instead of calling execution context as a variable, we can use wildcards on the git variable alias um, that way. Um, and so at this point, we're left with invoke expression. And when it comes to invoke obfuscation, we pretty much just dealt with IEX or invoke expression um, or a little bit different um, stuff like this, using automatic variables or environment variables and pulling out the letters I and E and X and then invoking that. Um, so in, uh, in the last two releases of invoke obfuscation, I added a set of um, IEX syntaxes like this. And we're going to see there's quite a bit more um, in Invoke Cradle Crafter. Um, oh, I lied. There is actually another cat picture in there. All right, two strikes. Three, I'm out. I'll have to sit down. So I, I hope that's the only one. Um, so that was token level obfuscation, the first of the four categories. Second, we have string level. And this is really simple. Basically, take your entire command, treat it as a string, and then do any string manipulation, and then just invoke it with invoke expression or whatever else you'd like. Third, we have encoding. Um, so the current, uh, the current public version of invoke obfuscation has these six, 
ASCII hexadecimal, octal, all the way down to secure string, which is technically encryption, um, and bitwise XOR. And the fourth category is obfuscated launchers. Um, and so with this, we can do things like um, echoing the PowerShell command into PowerShell dash or PowerShell IEX input. And what this allows you to do is push code to PowerShell standard input. And so you can see these are sysmon logs. So PowerShell's arguments doesn't actually contain the command, but its parent does. Now you can take this a step further and set your PowerShell command into an environment variable one, and then set PowerShell dash in environment variable two, and then echo var one into var two. And we've actually seen fin eight do this uh, as uh, recently as this February. Um, and this is what it looks like in the uh, event logs. So the arguments of the actual command content are actually pushed all the way up to the grandparent process. Um, and uh, there's an interesting uh, post, uh, John Lambert from Microsoft, if you're not following him, you definitely should. He tweets a lot of really interesting things, that, evil things that he's finding in the wild. And he posted this doc, uh, had some interesting um, obfuscation going on. And uh, Nick Carr, a colleague of mine, uh, tweeted and said, hey, we've actually seen Fin8 doing this. Uh, here's a decoder that I uh, pushed to GitHub to decode this. And then another colleague of mine, um, Ian All, said, um, yeah, this lines up really well with some samples that we've been seeing. And so you can see the screenshot here. Um, fin8 is setting this command in the very bottom variable. On uh, the very bottom, they're setting it in variable one. In variable two, they're setting this PowerShell dash. And then what you actually see on the command line um, is command echo var1 to var2. Does that look familiar? So th in the first uh, phase of invoke obfuscation, this is how I did it. But I actually took it one step further um, in later releases and basically created environment variable three, which is the contents. It is literally the command echo var1 pipe var2. And so now all you see in invoke obfuscation is command slash c var3. That's it. And so these are the current options. Again, in the public version of invoke obfuscation, here's the latest um, that's there. And that standard n++ is uh, the example that we just looked at. So what that's, th that's, that's some of the recent uh, stuff in obfuscation that we've seen attackers using. Um, so what does detection look like for this? Well, uh, as, as hopefully there's examples out there where AV is catching um, some of these scripts that are obfuscated at the token layer. I've still yet to see it, um, but again, hopefully that uh, they're catching up. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is that obfuscation does not affect heuristics. So if you're looking at PowerShell accessing LSAS memory space uh, from Invoke Mimikatz, obfuscation is not going to help you there. It's still going to perform that action, um, but it will, uh, it will likely get around um, detection of the script itself, unless you're doing some interesting stuff um, that we'll talk about. Um, it's been really neat to see some of our uh, technically competitors in the industry um, updating their uh, command line detection um, for some of this obfuscation. So that's been really exciting to see. Um, a lot's changed since the initial um, release of Invoke obfuscation, so uh, I hope that they've been keeping up. But overall, uh, that, that's my goal, is, uh, is that we all as a community um, across all industries will get better at detecting this kind of activity. Um, and it's been really neat to see uh, APT32 which is a Vietnamese attacker, also known as Ocean Lotus, um, using invoke obfuscation. Um, I think their inner command is uh, stuck because they, they go through a lot of layers. Uh, I've spent a bit of time in the past couple weeks uh, de-obfuscating um, and kind of, uh, kind of hating, hating life for a little bit, but it's been uh, really interesting to see how they're using it. Um, so some, some interesting things, if you're not aware of these, that I think are, uh, are going to be beneficial in, uh, in detecting this kind of stuff. One is um, AMSI the anti-malware scan interface. Um, and this allows registered AV vendors to access um, mostly deobfuscated content from a lot more than just PowerShell, from, uh, from BBScript and several others. Um, but ultimately, it still relies on the AV vendor having a signature um, that will detect on that content. And today, still really not seeing um, it being flagged on, on any of this. Um, and hopefully, hopefully that will change very soon. The other one is um, from Lee Holmes, and he was actually on the PowerShell team at Microsoft, and now is currently a, uh, a lead security architect um, for the Azure team. Um, and he has this great, great blog post um, actually looking at invoke obfuscation output. And, uh, and uh, he created these two functions um, that is on his GitHub of frequency analysis and vector similarity. Really, really cool stuff. And this has been the kind of stuff that I get really excited about and have been doing some research on the side um, to, to, to look more into that. All right. For the new stuff, more craft encrypted cradles. You know what? I know what this next slide is, and it's another cat. But this one is really the last one, I promise. This is the last one. And I had to put this in here because uh, more, I'm obviously using a different spelling than, uh, than what's in the, the dictionary, but it comes from more plus roar, more very loudly, I suppose. So these are the three categories of new stuff that we're going to talk about today. When it comes to cryptic cradles, the first category is just obscure syntaxes, no obfuscation whatsoever. So uh, Matt Graber actually tweeted this last week. Um, this is actually a download cradle, IWR. 
an alias for invoke web request. It was introduced in PowerShell three years later, so you don't see it that much, because typically, you know, red teamers and attackers like their stuff to work on PowerShell two or later, but it totally works. So we'll look at this in a lot, um, a lot of other ones. Then we'll look at obscure token obfuscation. And again, completely different obfuscation than what you see in invoke obfuscation, but it allows to take a command like this and transform it into something like this, all through really interesting means of enumerating commandlets, methods, members, and properties. Then we'll look at some in, uh, obscure invocation syntaxes, looking at some PowerShell 1 syntax, PowerShell 3 syntax, um, and several others. So, breaking it down into two categories, and this is how the tool does it as well, disk-based and memory-based. Um, disk-based, uh, Quantity loves disk-based stuff because they're downloading, you know, an XE to run. But um, I think disk base is actually uh, really overlooked, and it's sad because it has uh, some interesting potential um, that a lot of people aren't looking for. Um, one would be, what if you just always downloaded your payload to the profile script and then just ran PowerShell? Now everything in that script gets run, nothing on the command line. Pretty inter interesting stuff. Obviously, it's all going to be in PowerShell event logs, but sadly, most people don't have PowerShell um, 5 or even 3 for that matter. So there's really not too much, uh, not too much to do there. Um, so download file, again, this is the most common one that we see um, commodity malware using. We do actually see a bit of commodity using bits admin. Um, so bits admin is actually deprecated, but you know, still works. And start bits transfers PowerShell's version. Now what's interesting about these? Well, um, they actually work uh, with constrained language mode. So Matt Graber and Casey Smith have been doing a lot of awesome talks on device guard, um, which uh, can enforce constrained language mode. Um, and so these will still work in constrained language mode if you're on a system that has that and need to download some stuff. One thing to keep in mind is that the file that you're downloading, if it does not return a file size, like uh, if your file is on pastebin, for example, it's not going to return a file size if you're pulling that raw data. And Bits needs that to do what it does, the background intelligent transfer service. It needs that file size, so you're going to get an error like this. So definitely want to test your payload to make sure is the server speaking the right language so that Bits will work when it downloads it. Now the memory-based cradles. Again, first one, fan favorite. This is what we see all the time. I'm not going to spend any time there. Download data and open read. Main difference here is that you have it returning as a byte array or a byte stream. So we have to do a little bit more work around that command to get it back to an expression before we invoke it. Invoke web request and invoke rest method. This is what Graber tweeted, the IWR. These are also both, uh, these will both work on uh, systems with constrained language mode enabled. Um, but these are introduced in PowerShell three or later. So that's something that you have to keep in mind. Um, invoke web request also has some nice aliases, wget and curl. I don't think I've actually ever seen those being used, but they, they totally work. This is actually probably my favorite, which is really, it's really strange. It, it's, it's not really that sexy, but it has some nuances that I think are just really cool. So uh, basically calling the net HTTP web request uh, class directly. Um, and you're able to do this without having to say new object and then the class name. And uh, you can actually do the same thing with one, two, and three. Um, oh, that was not the laser. You can do the same thing with download string, um, download data, and download uh, file and open read. But uh, it's only in PowerShell three or later. All right. So that's number six. Number seven, this one is strictly for the lols. Um, if you have money on getting a cradle to work, don't put it on this one, all right? Um, I, I considered not putting it in the tool, but I spent like over 50 hours on it trying to get it to be more reliable. Um, so your results may vary. So th this one is technically unsupported in the tool. Please don't open up get issues on this one. But basically, if you have Notepad and go to open, and instead of a file name, put in a URL, then Notepad will fetch your freaking payload for you, which is awesome, because now PowerShell's not making a network connection. So basically, uh, this syntax uh, in this tool will automate that. It'll basically spawn Notepad off the screen, um, use send keys to, to send keystrokes to automate all this, uh, control A, control C to select all, copy all, and then uh, invoke uh, the contents off the clipboard. Um, inline scripting. Oh, let me go back. Uh, com objects. Um, so this is basically PowerShell interacting with uh, other applications through COM to have them go fetch the payloads. A lot quieter, a lot cleaner than send keys and notepads. You don't have stuff flying up in front of the user. Um, these are really, really cool. Um, and then the last two are inline scripting and pre-compiled scripting. So basically PowerShell can host several other scripting languages. C Sharp is the default, but um, JScript, Visual Basic, et cetera. And so you can basically put in, in this case this is C Sharp, put in your code. Uh, and then just do add type, and what it'll do on the target system, it will compile and execute that code. Now, if you want to be a little quieter, you can pre-compile it um, and just load the bytes um, directly onto your target system. The thing you have to keep in mind is to, that there has to be compatibility between the versions of, of the .NET compilers that are on each system. All right, that was looking at the obscure cradles. Now, what does obfuscation look like? How is it actually different than invoke obfuscation? Well, let's take a look at the same basic download cradle. So we have our member obfuscation, or sorry, our method obfuscation here. 
So download string. One thing that we can do is say, okay, this is a method of net.webclient, the class. So what if we just say new object net web client dot ps object dot methods? It's going to give us this huge list of all the method names. You could also do the same thing in a lot cleaner syntax with get member. Um, and both of these are options in the tool. But we'll stick with uh, ps object for this one. Now what we can do is then enumerate that and say, okay, I want to know when it, where the object name is download string. And then we see there's actually two. There's the overloaded definition. Well, I would actually just like the name of that. Now that gets me the string download string. And so what really makes this fun is see download string. What if we just randomly select from a set of nice wildcarded strings to get download string? And you're going to see this theme repeated greatly. So now this becomes a string download string. So now we're going to pop it up into the command. And if you notice that dot invoke, this is necessary for PowerShell 2, but it's not necessary for PowerShell 3. But everything produced in this tool, unless it explicitly says 3.0 or later, it will work across the board. So that dot invoke will be there. New object. So how does invoke cradle crafter handle command line obfuscation? Well, we can use uh, git command, new object, right? And, and, and then invoke the result that comes back. So we can use a dot under ampersand to invoke it. Git command can be any of these aliases. So we'll just choose command. And the new object, you guessed it, wildcards. So randomly select one of these in the tool. Now that's our new object. Now something really interesting here. Since we obfuscated download string, we've actually introduced another new object. So the, the only reason I bring this up is because I spent way too much time making this work because I'm, I'm really OCD about this kind of stuff working. But basically the whole code is comprised of tags and embedded tags so that um, at any point, if you ever introduce another new object, it will take on the identity of the original one. So both are going to be replaced. And this gets really, really big really fast um, when you start to look at some of the bigger cradles. In addition, we could have used this just randomly selected 1.0 syntax to do the same thing. Pretty disgusting, right? Um, and this one is actually, you can see down here, this is finding the 1.0 uh, method git command name. That's the one that it shows there. Other things that are being obfuscated behind the scenes. So invoke obfuscation does so much obfuscation, but you can't really control what it does where. With invoke cradle crafter, since we're dealing with such a smaller command, I wanted to have almost full control over every piece of it. And you'll see in the tool um, that hopefully it gets you pretty darn close to that. These are some of the options that will be um, obfuscated randomly behind the scenes that you don't necessarily get to explicitly select. So where object, we can use any of its aliases there. And then for like, um, a lot of, I think I see a lot of detections built on stuff looking for like dash like. That's going to burn you because you can use dash C like for case sensitive or I like for case insensitive. So there's a lot of those things that you need to keep in mind when you're writing detections for this kind of stuff. In addition, dollar undersign. This is for the current variable. Well, it hit me one day when I was looking at the automatic variables about page. It talked about this variable called underscore. I was like, oh my gosh, that's that. So we don't have to use dollar sign underscore. We can use get variable or any of its aliases underscore. In addition, dash value only can be any of these substrings because of how parameter binding works in PowerShell. And we could also do dot value. It gets, uh, it gets crazier from there. So we can also use get item variable or GI or item or the aliases there. In addition, you can just throw like a forward or backslash after that colon and it still works. Um, we can also do the same thing with get child item and any of its aliases. Um, so a lot of options there for that uh, current variable. Another thing we can do with invoke cradle crafter is since, since the only input this tool will take is a URL from you of where your stage payload is, it'll take a post cradle command. So again, if, you're, if your cradle was uh, invoke mimikatz script, you probably want to run after that invoke mimikatz dash dump creds, whatever. So you can, uh, you can uh, enter a command afterwards, and we'll see why that's important to, for the tool to have in some of the invocation syntaxes. Um, but we can also do things like rearrange the command by breaking things out into um, variables. So for example, we have the option to, to use logical variable names like ds for download string and logical variable syntax with dollar sign, or we can do random variable names with random variable syntax. And the last section is obscure uh, invocation syntaxes, which we'll look at right now. So there's over 10 different invocation syntaxes um, across the board. Um, the disk-based cradles have a couple more. But pretty much, we have our standard IEX. I'm not going to spend any time there. We have git alias and git command, again, using wildcards um, to uh, retrieve the command that we're interested in. PowerShell 1.0, we have git commandlets. We saw one sample of that already. Um, the first one is like the basic uh, syntax, and the second one is just a random op uh, obfuscated version. Um, invoke script, PowerShell 1.0 syntax to uh, execute uh, an expression or a script block. We then have invoke command, which this is going to force us to need to cast uh, an expression to a script block before we invoke it. 
Um, PS run space, this one's really cool. Uh, Matt Graber actually um, had this idea uh, a couple months ago and shared it with me. Um, and it's basically just creating a PowerShell run space, shoving the code in it with this add script and then a dot invoke and you're off to the races. Um, concatenated IEX, this is the one I've had the most fun with. It gets a little crazy as you can see. So let me cover these last three real quick and then we'll come back to that. Invoke is workflow. This is PowerShell three or later. Pretty darn close to invoke expression except everything's confined to the workflow. So when you use option uh, nine, and option seven, um, if you have a post cradle command, like again, invoke me cats dash dump creds, that has to be done in the same run space or workflow as the invocation itself. So that's why the tool takes that command. So if you're copying and pasting out and expecting to always put your command at the end, it's not gonna work with those two. Um, but the tool handles that and puts it in the proper run space or, um, uh, or workflow. So, uh, the last two, dot sourcing and import module. These are just you know, interesting ways that you can load scripts that are on disk. Um, for any of the disk-based download cradles. So concatenated IX, coming back to that. Um, and, and again, in the latest version of Invoke Obfuscation, we do stuff like this. Pulling out the letters I, E, and X from uh, environment variables like ComSpec or Shell ID, which is an automatic variable in PowerShell. This is the only subtle overlap between these two tools. And that Invoke Cradle Cracker takes this, but it basically puts everything on steroids and says, okay, we're never going to call, uh, we're never going to assume that we're going to call uh, a variable with a dollar sign and let's use wildcards wherever we can. So now that becomes our com spec and shell ID. And this is the newest part. So if we take a string, in this case it's an empty string, it doesn't matter, and we pipe it to get member, there are a ton of members that a string has. So look at the very bottom, we have this index of. That one conveniently has the letters I and E and X. Ah, let's, let's look at that one. So if we do string.index of, then we can see, okay, there's actually a lot of overloaded definitions there. I would love to get my hands on any of those I's and E's and X's, but it's an object. So let's throw it into a string. So we'll randomly choose between two different string syntaxes. Now we have this long string that gives us a lot of options. So for example, if we use the index 0, 7, or 8, that gives us IEX. But these are all the options that are in the tool. So I basically went through, wrote a script to enumerate every single um, member of these uh, string functions and pull out every single I, E, and X that works across PowerShell 2, 3, 4, and 5 and threw it into the tool so it'll be randomly selected every single time um, so the numbers will never be the same. But there's obviously some stuff that you can key off of in here uh, if you're looking just at the overall syntax itself. Whew. All right. So most of you would say, hey, all that stuff you just said is really great for red teamers and sucks for blue teamers, right? All right, well, uh, wh what's the good news? What's the redeeming factor for the blue teamers, right? Because that, that's who I am. Uh, well, behavior is doesn't not, not really going to be affected by obfuscation. So wh what's the bigger picture? What are some behaviors or artifacts that we can look for to detect this kind of activity? Um, first, network connections. Uh, and, and one of the big, uh, one of the reasons I went down this rabbit hole with this project is, what if an organization th that your target is, uh, is just looking for PowerShell making network connections, period? well, how can we pawn off network connections on other binaries? And that's the coolest part of this project, in my opinion. Um, so for example, when you use bits, um, either bits admin or start bits transfer, SVC host actually makes a network connection. And it's not really, a, a, there, there's no parent-child process relationship between PowerShell and SVC host in that, uh, in that uh, process. For a com object, Word, Excel, IE, those applications make the network connection. And with SIN keys and Notepad, actually Notepad and SVC host make the network connection. Actually, they make quite a few network connections depending on how big your payload is. So something to keep in mind there. Uh, Parent-child process relationships. Again, if you're calling bits admin from PowerShell, that's pretty darn suspicious. And again, a lot of commodity malware does this. We see this quite a bit. Um, but when it comes to com objects, what's great is that WinWord and Excel and IE get spawned by SVC host. PowerShell doesn't even spawn them. So no great parent-child process relationship there. SIN keys and Notepad, well, uh, in order to get the PID for Notepad to try to make it a little more reliable, technically PowerShell does spawn Notepad. You could use WMI or some other stuff to do that, but it's, in my opinion, not really worth the effort to go to that length. And then for inline scripting, on the target system, if you do, if you have embedded inline C-sharp or anything else, it will compile on the target system. So you'll see PowerShell, CSC, and CVT res on the target system. So if you're not doing any compilation of C-sharp and PowerShell in your environment, that's a pretty darn good indicator to look for because a ton of groups, a lot of financial groups, love to use shell code loaders that are written in C-sharp. So we see this quite a bit. This has been really helpful on a lot of investigations. Um, event logs, besides command line auditing and basically every PowerShell log, um, Bits Admin has its own uh, event log that logs by default, which is really great. So your UI is gonna be sitting in there. I'm not saying clear it, just saying be aware of it. Um, and as defenders, it's something we should look for. Also, if you're using Notepad, um, you'll see run DLL making um, this dav set cookie with your URI in the command line arguments. 
So DLL's loaded. Uh, there's a lot of interesting ones here. When PowerShell, actually when anything loads IE as a com object, it's gonna load a nice little DLL called IE proxy. How often does PowerShell do that? If you're doing this from a macro, how often does WinWord load IE proxy? Uh, and where would we find that? Prefetch files is a great place to have the prefetch file still there. The one thing I really wanna draw your attention to is PowerShell net that web client. It loads a lot of DLLs. You can see here a couple, but RAS API 32 and RAS min DLL. Um, one of our consultants found this uh, late last year in an engagement, and what's really cool about this is that it happens to create a nice registry key for you every time any binary loads those to make a network connection. Now, you can't trust the timestamp on the registry key because it inherits it from the parent registry key, but if PowerShell is not used to make network connections in an environment, and let's say an unnamed fin group went through and was using PowerShell to download a second stage uh, payload, then you're gonna see these reg keys all over the place for every system that second stage ran on. Pretty convenient stuff, right? Add compact cache. Uh, again, if we see this shell loading activity, we're gonna see the very specific order of PowerShell, CSC, CVT res, and app compact cache whenever uh, these C-sharp loaders are being run in PowerShell. Really good to look for. And lastly, cache temporary files. When you're using WinWord, Excel, IE, or Notepad, it, it's, it's kind of memory only, but not really, because the applications will cache crap in temporary internet files, or INET cache, depending on your OS. So, and uh, a lot of times, the full payload will be there. So that's something to keep in mind. Again, I'm not saying go and delete these cache files, but they are there as a defender, so some yard rules might be pretty helpful to go through and look. <sighs> All right, it's demo time. Let's see if this works. Oh, of course, the obligatory, please do not use this for evil, have full consent of whatever environment you're using this in. And I don't say that jokingly, please. Um, I'll come back. Can y'all see that all right? All right, and this, I pushed this code about 20 minutes before I came up here, so it is live. Uh, oh, habit. <laughs> Invoke cradlecrafter.psd1. You misspelled out? Oh. Thank you. All right, and now we're gonna call invoke Cradle Crafter, and there's my ASCII art. Spent way too much time on that. Basically building out a nice uh, obfuscated cradle there. And actually does run that command, that invoke Cradle Crafter, so you can go home and play with that if you'd like. Um, so uh, we have very, very similar to invoke obfuscation. Um, we have a nice tutorial here. So basically everything in yellow takes you to a new menu and everything in green actually applies something. So if we get to the tutorial, you'll see step one is basically setting your fields. So URL and then path and post cradle command are optional. Um, so for example, let's do set URL, bit.ly, zifcon ASCII. We'll see what that is later. All right, so we have memory and disk as our two options. So memory, uh, you can see here very clearly if it's PS3 or later, it's in bright red. So please don't, don't yell at me if your stuff doesn't work on PowerShell 2 because it's pretty darn explicit in the tool. So PS web string, if we go here, I took a lot of pain to go through and actually build out information. Every time you enter a new Cradle context, and say, here's artifacts, behaviors, uh, indications that this thing may have just happened so that as blue teamers, we have no excuse to not be looking at, at these artifacts. And as red teamers, you can make a more informed selection about what Cradle you wanna use in what situation. Um, so please do look at that. And if you see any errors, please let me know and, uh, and we'll get those uh, updated. Um, so uh, rearrange. Um, by default, this is a one-liner command here. Uh, if I do multivariable, it'll break it out into normal variable syntax and normal variable names. Now, if you notice here, um, that URL is in blue, right? So, every, again, I took way too much time on this. Any input that you have, that, which is your URL, a path, and post cradle command, will always appear in blue. So when the command gets really crazy, you know what's the stuff that I contributed to. The whole command will be white except for the thing that just changed. So all the yellow pieces, all the things that just changed. So if we do random variable, those are all the things that changed there. And I really took way too much time doing this because the point of this isn't to create some hack tool, it's to help inform users of how you can substitute these pieces and why it still works. So we'll leave that rearrange option. Um, commandlet, for new object, again, the default is just do dash object. Um, we can use git command, so in this case it's using um, git dash command 
Um, now it's using command. You'll see it's using random invocation operator as well as uh, wildcard string. So we'll go with that one. Uh, method, download string is the default. Uh, number two would be the PS object enumeration. So this is our wildcard that is selected for download string. Um, this is almost the same except it's using get member instead of PS dot object uh, or PS object dot method. So we'll go with that one. Um, invoke. So um, by default, I do not add an invoke function. And the reason is because sometimes you probably don't want to run that cobalt strike stager in, in, on your system, but you want to make sure, that, you know, is this Debo's guy's obfuscation? Is it actually working? Um, let me just make sure before I add invoke that it actually downloads the payload. Um, in this case, we'll just go ahead and add an invoke. And again, we have um, our regular invoke syntax before or after. Um, git alias is three. We have git command, pretty much all the things we walked through. Um, and then nine, of course, my, um, my favorite is doing randomized um, IEX concatenation. So we'll go with this. And now we can just run test. And if it works, there we go. I heart Zipcon. So this is our payload, right? And so if you're like me, that was a lot of keystrokes to go through and do that. So I've, of course, um, included the nice all, and you can just, you know, do all of it at once, as many times as you want. And again, invoke obfuscation, if you kept hitting one, 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 it would grow, 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 grow. This isn't, because this is not adding to. It's simply making substitutions in all the places that it can. So typically what I'll do is I'll go through and I'll put all obfuscation, and then I'll go back and start to, to pick the ones I want to make sure. Uh, I want to make sure it's this syntax. Let me go through and repeat, repeat until it's the syntax that I like. And you'll see that in some of these other ones, like PS com object IE, there's a lot more properties here. There's a lot more things you can change um, and a lot more information up here. And if I go all there, then that, that's, a, that's a chunk of change right there. That's a lot of cradle. Um, so again, I hope that the colors are informative and actually help you know, convey uh, what's happening behind the scenes. Um, and uh, right now, um, there's a few cradles that are still in uh, testing, so namely the inline C sharp and the bits. Um, those will be released within the next two weeks. Um, so bear with me on that, but I hope, uh, I feel like this is enough to, to get off to the races and get a, a good head start on um, when it comes to testing these from a red team and blue team perspective. So closing comments. Please do not run away from PowerShell, because a lot of people are saying that. Um, there's so much good that PowerShell can do, and the logging and security features that come with PowerShell 5 are insanely good. Just so few people have them. And I, I totally realize that it produces a ton of logs. Um, and there's some, there's some research that I'm working on to help, uh, to, to help make available some, some techniques, uh, as opposed to me just saying, hey, you should look for like a lot of you know, uh, you know, characters and frequency analysis. Like, like it'd be cool if there was an open source thing that actually just did that, right? So anyways, hopefully more on that later. Um, my message, upgrade to PowerShell 5, please. Um, even if you don't have the capacity to look at the stuff, like turn on the logs, aggregate the logs. And if nothing else, just set up a cron job and start grepping through for something. Like we all need to start somewhere um, and get these small wins um, and expand our detection to include more and more artifacts that we looked at um, on this list. Um, and as always, uh, you'll hear me talk about breaking our assumptions of what we always thought a cradle would look like um, and again, like, what if Notepad's downloading the payload? Or what if IE or something else is? Um, and how would, that, how would that bypass some of our detections today? And how can we uh, make changes to uh, not be bypassed? And we need to accept that we're going to miss stuff. We're all humans. And there's people way smarter than me that are doing stuff we've never even thought about before that hopefully we'll find an investigation at some point and write a blog about or something. Um, but uh, ultimately, we can't expect to be able to solve all this in one fell swoop. It takes time. It takes failing. It takes repeated tries and tries again. And the most beneficial thing that we can do is to share both successes and, more importantly, failures with the community so that we all get better together in forums just like this. So huge, huge thanks to a lot of my colleagues, in particular um, Nick Carr, Ian All, and Matt Dunwoody. They, uh, they really make my job extremely fun um, and make hunting just, just unbelievably cool. Um, Matt Dunwoody's actually been doing some really cool stuff with um, detecting this stuff in memory uh, that's been really, really fascinating to watch. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, my colleague Evan Pena. He's one of our red team guys who uh, undoubtedly performed uh, the insane level of QA on several iterations of this cradle. So Evan, uh, big shout out to you. And then lastly, uh, I'd just like to thank my wife Paige because she really supports me um, in doing this research. And when, when it's hundreds and hundreds of hours sitting at home in front of your laptop doing this kind of stuff uh, at crazy hours into the night, um, it, it's not the most fun, for, uh, fun thing for her to sit and watch me do. Um, so I really do appreciate, uh, appreciate that support. That was a lot of content. Um, and I would like to say that please reach out to me on Twitter, and I'll be around all day today, be around tomorrow as well. So please come talk to me if you have any questions, criticisms, comments. I'd love to talk to you and hear what you have to say. And from the bottom of my heart, 
I've had the best time in Poland. First time here, awesome time at Zifcon, so thank you very much for having me.